To dim the eye and all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, what a day.
glad Jesus is coming again. Let me say to all of those that's been so faithful uh, in the midst of this pandemic to give and mail your tithes in, drop them off at the door, the mailbox or online giving our churches, not just this one but our churches everywhere could not have survived uh, during the midst of this pandemic. We, we didn't get a letter from Georgia Power saying uh, our $6,000 a month power bill, they're going to write that off during the pandemic. They didn't do that. Uh, we didn't get a notice from our insurance company that we pay about 100000 a year to insure everything you see and our other properties. Uh, they didn't send us a letter saying they were going to cancel that. And we didn't get any PPE money. Didn't want none of their money. Uh, I'm just telling you, we have bills to pay and our people, God's children. I'm so excited about it. I've been so faithful to the Lord and that shows me two things. You love the Lord and you love your church and you want to see it continue to go on for the glory of God. In fact, I'm so excited about it, I'd turn a cartwheel but I'm too fat and I'd bump into my stomach on the way back up. Say amen right there. But I'm not the only one but I'll tell you, God is good and I appreciate the good blessings of the Lord. Don't forget the service tonight at the 6 o'clock hour. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time. I believe somebody's going to get some help tonight that they have been needing. And I believe the hand of the Lord would be upon you. Now, it's a couple of weeks away, but go ahead and put it in your calendar. The Sunday before Memorial Day, we're going to have a pre-Memorial Day jubilee. And what we've been doing, we've been, we've been kind of testing the waters and see uh, how you support this because we're praying about extending that uh, in a couple of years, that whole week of Memorial Day and having a, just a big camp meeting jubilee. And, and, but we've got a great day planned. In that morning service, we're going to have a brother here that was in the Marines in Vietnam, and uh, his, his battalion got attacked. And out of the 40 men that was in that little hole, he's the only one that survived. In fact, they shut him up in a body bag, and one of the medics told the pilot and the copter, said, hey, this one's moving. And he lived, and God saved him and called him to preach. And he's been pastoring a little Indian church right outside of a, uh, of a Navajo Indian reservation. And he has got a testimony and a half, and he'll be with us that morning. And then that night, we're going to start about seven instead of six. And we've got two gospel groups, two preachers. And when it's dark enough, we're going to shoot off some fireworks. We're going to light up Clayton County. Amen. And red fireworks. And so you'll enjoy that. That went most over all of you's head. But anyway, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time. And mark that down in your calendar. All right, Brother Tom, you come with our special music today. And we're going to get into the Word of God and hold on to your seatbelt. I didn't eat razor blades this morning. I ate three or four Hostess Twinkies, so I'm going to be sweet today. It's going to be good. Crossing the dark sea with Jesus, the disciples were getting concerned. Wind started violently blowing, but he was asleep in the stern. Oh, does he not care that we perish? We're helpless, we're so afraid. Then Jesus awoke when they called him and said to them, Where is your faith? Because you prayed all night. Cause you've held on with all of your might Child, your cries have awoken The Master, He knows your voice Lift your hands, it's time to 
Someone said, what in the world could we learn from the Lord falling asleep in that storm? Well, you learn this. He's got it under control. And he's resting, and so should we. Glory to God, that I'll make a Methodist want to get sprinkled again. 
The Lord is good. Isaiah 58 in your Bible this morning. And I'm going to read one verse. And then I'm going to read uh, two verses in another passage. And then we're going to bring the message this morning. I have solicited some help for my two brothers. So y'all come on up here, brother. And, and uh, you take this chair. And you, here you take that chair. And I've got a nickname for my helpers today. This is Hot Lips 1. And that's Hot Lips 2. And when we start the sermon, you'll understand the illustration here today. Isaiah chapter number 58 and verse number one. God is telling his prophet by the name of Isaiah to do this. You ready? Cry aloud. Point number one, I got Bible for being a loud preacher. Cry aloud. Number two, spare not. That means preach it, brother. Leave no stones unturned. Read the mail. Can I get an amen? Here, number three, lift up thy voice. And then he uses an interesting analogy. Say it with me. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Lift up thy voice like a what? A trumpet. And show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. And so I'm interested today in that little phrase, the third command of the prophet. Lift up thy voice, say it with me, like a trumpet. You don't have to turn there, but in Joel, chapter number two, God called another prophet, and he told him in Joel, chapter two, and verse number one, blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Here's what every preacher ought to be doing in 2021, and sound an alarm. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Chapter 2 of Joel, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. At about 30 different times in the Bible, you'll find where God likened the voice of the believer, the voice of the remnant, the voice of the redeemed is a voice like a trumpet that is supposed to be lifted and blown and sounded because the time was at hand. And without wasting a lot of time this morning, I, I, I do want to whet your appetite with this. I'm amazed at the different ways God illustrates the Christian worker in the Bible. A lot of times he is compared to as a watchman that is set upon the wall. And by the way, preachers are watchmen. And they don't need to be blind, silent watchmen. They need to watch out for the flock of God and lift their voice when they see the danger coming. Many times the Christian worker is likened unto a sower of seed. The wise man said, cast your bread, your seed upon the waters and in many days it shall return. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. A lot of times he is likened with a soldier with a sword in his hand fighting the enemy. And I don't believe this morning it takes a PhD to realize our nation, our families, even our churches since the coronavirus, we're in a battle for our very survival. 
I've been amazed at how Walmart and Home Depot and the liquor store and the tattoo parlor and the abortion clinic is essential, but church is optional. We're in the battle of our life. And on and on and on goes these wonderful analogies of the Christian worker. But in our text today, along with others, he is likened unto a voice, a witness, a light that shines in a dark world, a voice of reason, a voice of truth, a voice of hope, a voice of exhortation in a world that needs encouragement. John the Baptist was the voice of how many? One crying in the wilderness. And may I say this morning, don't ever underestimate the power of one. Oh, can I make that statement again? Don't ever underestimate the power of one. Because there was one Abraham. There was one Noah. There was one Joseph. There was one David. There was one John the Baptist. I'm going somewhere. There's one Jesus. Don't ever underestimate the power of one. For Moses had one rod, but it was enough. David had one sling, but it was enough. Samson had one jawbone, and it was enough. Gideon had one sword, and it was enough. The little boy had one lunch, but it was enough. Mary had one box and it was enough. I'm going somewhere. And Jesus had one cross and it was more than enough. And I want us to come today to Isaiah and the book of Joel where he likens the Christian, the the witness, the remnant, the believers, the righteous voice as a trumpet. As a trumpet is blown and sounded, it gives out a message and a signal that the remnant need to hear. I remember several years ago, I was helping Charles Wright. I mean, this was back in the early, early 80s. And uh, he was having a jolly 60s meeting with all the old people down there. And he said, Brother Joel, want you to come and, and bring your guitar and and said, bring that movie, Sheffy. We're gonna show Billy Kelly's Sheffy movie where Brother Billy played the bootlegger. And one of our members, his grandfather was the preacher. And they asked Brother Kelly, they said, "Uh, why did they get you to play the bootlegger? He said, they needed somebody with experience. You'll get that in a minute. And boy, there's one scene in that movie, Sheffy, where he gives his socks away to a needy man And by the time he rides his horse 50 miles from Roanoke, Virginia to uh, Abingdon, Virginia, over 100 miles, his feet are frostbit. And I don't remember who this man was, but he he was really serious. He spoke up and said, well, why did he go by Walmart and buy him another pair? And that's our thinking, man. When I think of soldiers communicating, I think of the walkie-talkies. I think that's how old I am. I remember the walkie-talkie. I remember me and Joseph started hunting together. He put a bud in his ear and I put a bud in my ear and we'd whisper over the walkie-talkies. Now we just sent the text. Back in that day, they they didn't have the walkie-talkies. They didn't have the satellite. Al Gore hadn't invented the internet. I don't know what they done. But in that day, they had to have a way to signal The other warriors, they had to have a way to signal the watchman and they used the trumpet. Now there are two words translated trumpet in the Bible. One main word is the word shofar. And let me borrow your shofar, my friend, just a minute. This was a horn from a ram. Now let me explain this real quick. You deer hunters know this. There is a biological difference between antlers and horns. Cows, rams, and if you've watched any Disney movies, unicorns. Beth thinks they're real. Horns. And because it is a horn, I'm not going to put that up there because some of you think I'm the devil anyway. They do not shed. They are 
permanent. They will be with that animal until he dies. A deer, an elk, a moose, a mule deer, they have antlers. They shed their antlers every year. In fact, if you go to Alabama and hunt in the late season and you kill a big buck, it's possible as you pull him through the woods, you can pull one of his horns off. That big old buck in, uh, in October will literally shed those horns and has to grow a new set. But the ram in that day did not shed his horns. His horns was there for the rest of, the, of his life that he lived. And it was from that ram's horn they made a shofar. And that is the main word translated trumpet in the Bible. I want my brother to give you a a blast of two of what it sounded like in that day when they blew the shofar, the ram's horn, called the trumpet. Give my brother a hand, that's good. That is the sound of the shofar, the ram's horn. And 90% of the time in the Bible, that is the word translated trumpet. But when you come to the temple worship, and I've studied this for months, the best I can tell when it comes to the temple worship, they use more than the ram's horn, they would use the silver trumpet. Now we could not find a silver trumpet, but we have found a trumpet made out of something else splattered with gold platinum, but in your mind this is a silver trumpet. And I want you to hear the sound of, and we'll call it a metal trumpet, a brass trumpet, a silver trumpet, a trumpet that was made, I'm going somewhere, from something that was dug up out of the heart of the earth, okay? Hot lips too, blow us our trumpet here. Charge. I started to have him blow that and preach on this subject today. The south shall rise again, but I'm not gonna do that. So you have the ram's horn, which is the shofar, and then you have the metal or the brass or the silver trumpet. Three things about the trumpet I want you to see this morning that's likened to the Christian witness. Number one, I want you to see the making of the trumpet. The making of the trumpet. How did they make the trumpets in the Old Testament? Well, let's look at this trumpet over here. It is made of brass or silver or some metal. Therefore, the ore they got to make this trumpet did not grow on a tree. It was not a processed animal. To get the ore where these silver or brass trumpets are made out of, you have to dig around in the dirt. You have to go down in the muck and in the mire of the dirt to get the ore to make the metal or the silver or the brass trumpet. Now, when they first dig down in the earth to get the ore, it doesn't come out a finished, beautiful trumpet. It comes out a hunk of ore that looks just like the rock that it was found beside. But the master trumpet builder, hallelujah, has the ability to distinguish between the old dead rock and a piece of ore he's gonna use to blow his voice through. You say, what has that got to do with us? Does anybody remember when you were dead in your sin in the miry clay and Jesus reached down in mercy into the dirt and minded you out and looked beyond your fault and saw your need and looked beyond what you were to see that he would use you as a vessel to blow his word through. And here's what they had to do. Here's what they had to do to take that hunk of ore to make it into a beautiful instrument. It had to be forged in the fire. 
It had to be forged in the fire. You know how you can take a piece of metal make all them turns and make all them corners and make all them valves and make all of that, you see, it has to be forged in the fire because when it's natural ore, it is hard, it is unshapeable, it is unmanageable, but when they put it in the fire, the master trumpet builder can have his way with it. He can turn it up, he can turn it down, he can blow it out. The master has his way with the ore because it's been forged in the fire. I don't like the trials, I don't like the test, I don't like the storms, but you know what God's doing in your life? when you can't find God and you can't feel God and you can't figure God he's putting you through the fire to mold and make your life to use your life and your tragedy and your storm and your affliction as an instrument to blow his breath through and give a message out that'll bless others glory boy after he finds that ore after he forges it in the fire Boy, I don't like this either. But he takes a hammer. And I promise I'm not gonna do this to your $5,000 trumpet. How much is this? $1,000, you hold it, just let me point to it. Who would pay $1,000 for that when you can buy a Browning X-Bolt 30-06 for that? Don't do it anyway. After he forges that in the fire, Oh, Gary, if I break it, I'll pay for it. I'm a doctor. I got malpractice insurance. Say amen right there. And after he forges in the fire, he'll take a hammer and he'll put it on an anvil and he'll have to beat. He'll have to hammer. He'll have to put the force and the pressure on that ore to make it a beautiful instrument. You say, preacher, what's going on in my life? I feel like I'm strapped over an anvil and somebody's got a hammer beating the tar out of me. You're there and the anvil is his wheel and my master, not the devil, has got the hammer in his hand and you say, what's he beating out of me? The devil. Sin, mostly yourself. Oh, but when the master trumpet maker uh, beats it into subjection, forges it in the fire, he'll take his little cloth, uh, his shining cloth, uh, oh, and he'll work on it and he'll polish it and oh, he'll pull it up real close and, and he, oh boy, he'll put the shine on it. Uh, and if you go out in the field where they've been digging for the ore and you see that little old hunk of ore with no shine and no shape, seemingly no meaning, just hold that trumpet in front of it uh, and say, oh boy, I know you just got out of the mire. I know you just got out of the dirt and you don't understand the fire. You don't understand the hammer, but you stay submitted in the hand of the master instrument maker and one day you'll have a shape, you'll have a shine, and you'll be on a service, and God's gonna take your life where nobody said we're about to anything and use it to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus. Does anybody remember when you was in sin and the world wouldn't give two shakes for your life and religion wouldn't give you two cents for your life but his hand reached further down and a process began and it took a bunch of us old battered lives, shined us up, fired us up, polished us up and now Romans 6 said, we're instruments of righteousness unto God. And if anybody, I felt Jesus on that point. And if anybody has a story to tell, if anybody has a trumpet to blow, if anybody whoop, has a message to give, it's you and I that was in the miry clay on our way to hell, but Jesus lifted us out. And I'm glad he's still working on me. Well, glory. You know what I want to say to this beautiful instrument? This is worldly, but I want to say it. You've come a long way, baby. 
Turn to somebody sitting to your left and say, are you saved? Do you know you're saved? Well, if you're saved, you've come a long way, baby. Julie went to hug me the other night and she said, you've come a long way, baby. I said, I know, honey, I was just a young preacher when I married you. She said, I'm talking about that belly of yours. You've come a long way, baby. I said, honey, at least you can get your arms around it. You know what I do like some of my buddies, they bark, they hug half, chalk it, run around and pick up where they left off. Can I get a witness? Anybody here saved by the grace of God, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, I want you to stand to your feet right now, lift both hands and say, we've come a long way, baby. God took your life that the devil tried to ruin and hell tried to ruin and sin tried to ruin and thank God he's took your sin and made you a servant. He took your misery and gave you a ministry. He took your trash and made you a trumpet. Hallelujah. You can be seated. You can be seated. So now, whoo, it, it gets better. Hallelujah. From the depths of the dirt. And now it's been forged. It's been blessed. It's been polished. It's been made. Don't let me down, Gary. Hot lips, too. It's now in the hand of a master trumpeteer. And now look what God has done with the trumpet from a hunk of nothing to a beautiful instrument that makes the sound. That said, Jesus said, It just said, born again, there's really been a change in me. Born again, just like Jesus said. Born again and all because of Calvary. I'm so very glad that I've been born. You say, I didn't hear all of that. I did. I won't tell you what that blast said. It said, I waited patiently upon the Lord and he inclined unto me and he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay and set my feet upon a rock, established my going, put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. If you're saved today, changed by the power of God, washed in the blood of Jesus, blow your trumpet, lift your voice and say, the old rugged cross made the difference. Thank you, my brother. That's great. Just stand there and look at these people. They want to stare at you while I'm preaching. Sit down. Now, we come to the main word for trumpet. I don't know if I'm going to get through this one or not. The shofar. Now, the difference between the shofar and the brass or the silver trumpet is just not the material it's made out of. It's who produced it. How it was produced and the process in which it was received. I got to take you to Genesis 22. Remember when God said, Abraham, I want Isaac. Bring him out here to this mountain. Build an altar. Set it on fire. Tie that boy to it. When I tell you, son, take the knife. And Abraham obeyed God. Laid him on the altar. Set it on fire. Put the knife back. God said, hold it. That's enough. I see now that you fear me. I see now that you'll hold nothing from me. Look behind you called in the thicket by his horns was the ram and the ram gave his life in the stead of his son. Do you know why it had to be caught in the thicket by the horn? Because a sacrifice worthy to die for the sins of the guilty, listen to this, had to be without spot and without blemish. 
Why, if them thorns would have caught that ram by his leg, by his back, by his belly, by his face, by his neck, he would not have been a spotless lamb. That's why he's caught by his horns. By the way, the only sacrifice that could suffice the holiness of God and the righteousness of God for a bunch of guilty sinners like us is the impeccable, immaculate, pure, perfect son of the living God who died in our place, who tasted death, that we might live again. Now remember, that ram has to be without spot or blemish. Remember I told you a while ago, the ram's not like a deer. He doesn't shed his horns and grow them, antlers and grow them back. You cut off a ram's horn, it's cut off the rest of his life. He lives the rest of his life with one horn or no horn. So therefore, the only way they could get the horn to make the shofar and that ram still, glory to God, be acceptable and perfect for the sacrifice, they had to get the horn to make the trumpet from the rams that had been offered as a sacrifice. My God, somebody shout glory right there. You know why this little ram's horn is gonna be used oh, to have a ministry and have a voice and had a witness? Oh, Lord, have mercy. That was a sacrifice made. That was a death that died. That was blood that shed, but risen off of the altar and not consumed by the fire, raised out of death, raised out of destruction. It's the little ram's horn to be used as a ministry. Oh, my soul, let me say to you the reason why the Christian has a witness, the reason why we have a voice, the reason why we have a testimony, the reason why we have a story, the reason why we have a ministry is because 2,000 years ago, the Son of God died for the sons of men that the sons of men might become the sons of God. And because he died for me and bled for me and arose for me, and he, I got redeemed by his wonderful blood. I got a power. I got a ministry. I got a story. I got a voice. I got a witness. That's why the Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, glory. Because the innocent, whoo, had to die for the guilty. Now we have a shofar. Stand, my brother, and blow the sound of redemption. Whoop! You know what that just said? You know what I think I just heard? You know what I think I just heard? Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. You know what I think I just heard in that? That's power, wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. Blow her one more time, brother. I believe I hear another song coming on. Yep, I believe I just heard, I believe I just heard I believe I just heard what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus have we got anybody in this room have we got anybody in this room this morning by faith you've been to the cross the blood has been applied burdens are lifted at Calvary your life got changed at Calvary I want you to stand right now to your feet and turn to somebody beside of you and say Calvary covers it all Calvary covers Covers it all. Calvary covers it all. I had a black heart, washed it in red blood, and now it's whiter than snow because of Christ's death and his shed blood. I got a voice, I've got a witness, and I need to blow it for God. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Well, glory, the making of the trumpet. One's forged in the fire, 
whoo, and the other one's bought by the blood. The making of the trumpet. Number two, I gotta hurry. Notice the ministry of the trumpet. Now, whether it is the shofar or whether it is the silver trumpet, how was it used in the Bible? When you study the prophets, you'll find in a hurry a threefold use. And this is the introductory point to get to the last one. And I just want to warn you, this last point today, you may forget your baptist. And before you know it, you may be on your feet, standing on the back of that pew. Now, if some of you stand back there, it will be God. How was the ministry, how was it used? Three things. Number one, they would blow the trumpet in warfare. Say that with me. They would blow the trumpet in warfare. Gary, give us a charge. Give us a charge from the trumpet. That means get ready. There is a battle to fight. And when it's time to charge, they blow the trumpet. When it's time to get serious, they blow the trumpet. The hotter the battle, the more he'd blow. And I know you ain't got much air left, but that's all right. And watch this now. And even when one had been faithful, when one had been faithful, they would even blow the taps to celebrate him home. Can you do that? Mm Mm-hmm. We're getting there. Yeah, one more time. So there we go. Yeah. The voice of the trumpet. You say, why should the Christian lift their voice in this hour? Because we're in a battle of our life. We're fighting for our families. We're fighting for our churches. We're fighting for the proclamation of the gospel because every day there's a new enemy to religious liberty and freedom against our churches, against the gospel, and against our family. And it's time the church got out of the closet, ripped the muzzle off our mouth, and stood up and lifted our voice like a trumpet and charged sin and hell and this world with the power of the gospel. Hallelujah. They'd use it in warfare. Number two, the ministry of the trumpet, they would use the trumpet for worship. And they would get ready to go to the Holy of Holies. They would sound the shofar. And that means it's time to worship the Lord and give him the glory that he deserves. So far. You know what that means? I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. You know what I believe I just heard when he blew that trumpet? I believe I just heard, come and go with me to my father's house, to my father's house, to my father's house. Oh, come and go with me to my father's house where there's joy, joy, amen. I'm glad we can lift our voice today and say we're gonna worship God. We're gonna give him the glory and the praise that he deserves for that. That worship means worthy or worthship. And I'll admit to you today, I'm not worth much. And most people I know are not worth much. But when it comes to Jesus and his blood and his cross and his word and his Holy Spirit and his power, he is worthy of our praise. Somebody blow the trumpet and say, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Trumpet was used in the warfare, was used in the worship. Oh, but I love this one, number three. 
It was used in the wedding. I like the way they did it in the Old Testament. The father picked out who he wanted a girl to marry. And then he had to pay the father. How many of you daddies like that deal? Buford, you struck out on all accounts. I'm sorry about that. You probably had to pay them to take them off your hands. Say amen right there. Julie's mama. They come to hear me preach. I was a young preacher, broke, couldn't rub, Gus couldn't rub two nickels together. Had an old LTD, which means long-term debt. Had one in 1977, two doors. Had that 351 Cleveland in it. Passed everything but a gas station. And the catalytic converter went out on and it knocked. Listen, when me and Julia first got married, we came down out of the hills of Virginia and came down Peachtree Street in Atlanta. You know, you know what Ted Turner said? He looked at Jane Fonda and said, the clampets are back. Poor. But she knew I loved that girl. So my daddy, he knew that all, that's who I ought to marry. So he gave me $20 for gas. And Julie's mama would give us $10 Five, wow, well, she was cheap. Anyway, five dollars. And we'd go to the K&W, Canes and Walkers. You know, the cafeteria where all the old people eat. We had to go in and eat with all the old people. And for that five dollars, we'd get one entree, two vegetables, and a piece of pie, and two teas. I'm like Barney said to Andy, I ain't never went out on a date when it wasn't Dutch treat. Say amen, right? But in that day, the father would receive the payment of the groom, glory. And then that groom would go to his father's house to prepare a place for them to dwell. I'm going somewhere. It gets better. You ought to wait to the last one. And I'm working, David, as hard as I can towards that point. And John, don't get me stirred up again. I'll, I'll, I'll preach another hour. And when that place the groom had gone to prepare was finished, a trumpet would sound. That's good. I got the first syllable of that. And when that trumpet would sound, he would leave his father's place and go to the bride's place. Whoop! Final payment would be made. And when they left the bride's place to go back to the father's place, a trumpet would sound. Oh, the trumpet said, the son has left the house. The son has left the house. The son has left the house. Whoop. And at the last trump, the second trump, it means the bride has left her house and it's on its way back to the groom's house and the living and the dead shall be raised and I'm glad when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more when the roll is called up yonder I ain't gonna be there I'm gonna be there whoa when the trumpet sounds Ooh. Can you imagine when the father, which one of you boys wants to be Gabriel? Which one of you, which one of you thinks an angel? They both are fallen. <laughs> Boy, John said, Oh, Lord, I miss this. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, boy. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. You know who I am now when I get something right here in front of you and God and everybody. I have to just kind of take it easy and get this in my soul. Whew. Woo! 
John said, and I heard the voice of many waters, the voice of the trumpet. So boys, when I point to you, just grab a note and blow the sun out of that thing, you ready? The sun has left the house and now, That means pack your bags, children. Bid this world goodbye. We're going home to see the king. Brother, I'm glad in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the trumpet's gonna sound and the church is going home. And Gary, when we get to heaven, the Lord won't ever ask you to play taps. Oh, you didn't know it was wonderful. Because in that land, whoo, there is no taps. Reveille, reveille. Several years ago, I preached for Brother Bob Hall at, the, uh, at a church in Fredericksburg, Open Door Baptist Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia, 1987, second week in October. 50 degrees outside. And he said, Brother Joe, you like history. You know I do. He said, I want you to go with me to Fredericksburg Battlefield. And we walked up there on this little overlook. And he said, Brother Joe, you see that long, green, grassy mound? He said, at the end of the Battle of Fredericksburg, that night, it snowed about a foot and a half said early that morning Robert E. Lee walked out with his subordinate generals and his bugler and he looked out across that flat area and it was just covered with snow and one of the subordinate generals said to Robert E. Lee look at them look at them they deserted us they went A.W.O. well in the heat of the battle, they forsook us. They all left. They're probably hiding like little scared baby girls in the woods. Look, they deserted us. But Robert E. Lee knew better. He said to the bugler, blow reveille. And I don't know if you know that or not, but both of you just hike out on something real quick. You ready? Just blow. You ready? said when that bugler blew that he said all that in that little valley one would pop up over here and pop up over here and pop up over here what they'd done they'd fought that they'd gave out and they'd laid on the ground and covered themselves up with their coats but boy when they sounded reveille in the morning one got up over here and one got up over yonder and one got up over there oh lord Robert E. Lee said to his subordinate generals, he said, boys, one of these days, that's what it's gonna be like with Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And they blow the trumpet and these cemeteries wanna pop up over here, one over yonder and one over here. I wonder how many is gonna be in that number when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. Look out, children, look out. The next sound you're gonna hear is not another politician blaspheming and cursing and profaning the name of God. I'm listening for the sound of the trumpet when the church leaves the ground and we're homeward bound. Thank God, blow the trumpet. Well, glory. The making of the trumpet, the ministry of the trumpet. Now, here's my last one and I'm done. The might of the trumpet. The power, the influence of the trumpet. Now let me borrow your thousand dollar trumpet a moment. Is that pretty? That's pretty, ain't it? You know what? I believe that's a real trumpet. I don't believe it's one of them fake ones that's got a CD player stuck up under here and they play taps. This is a real trumpet. Pretty, ain't it? But as beautiful as that trumpet is, 
and as loud as that trumpet could be. If it lays on that floor right there till it tarnishes, it'll never make a sound. No matter how many rams had to die for us to harvest their shofars, That little horn can lay on the ground for a thousand years and never make a sound. Glory. Buckle up. Grab your gas mask. Nazarene fit number three on the way. You ready? The only way that horn or the only way that trumpet is ever going to make a sound of any kind. Whoo! Number one, it's got to be touched by the master's hand. Here's your running point. You ready? It's got to be touched by the master's hand. And then the only way, even though it's in the master's hand, the only way it's gonna make a sound got to have breath. The master, God have mercy, Jesus. Woo! The master has to breathe in it. For with five, I thought at least five would shout on that point right there. For the trumpet to ever make a sound, the master has to breathe in it. Try that one more time. For the trumpet to make a sound, the master has to blow his breath in it. And the only way you and I'll have a voice and a ministry and a message and a testimony, we gotta be touched by the master's hand and the breath of the Holy Ghost is gonna blow in us and through us and move upon us through the mighty breath of God. Whew. Well, Glory. Modern day religion is like beating a drum. But we need some of that old time religion that has the message clear and plain because it's got the touch of the master's hand. And the power of the master's breath. You can't blow that trumpet if you don't hold it in your hand. And that trumpet will never make a sound until you put some breath in it. So stand up, my buddy, and put some breath in it. If the moment he quits breathing, the moment it ceases to be effective, Church, the very moment the Holy Spirit takes his power and breath and hand and unction away from the church, we're just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, but with the power and the breath and the touch of God, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's shiny, it's nice, it cost a thousand dollars. Son, stand up, put your breath in it. And make it worth what it's been bought for. You know what we gotta make sure? 
We've got to make sure the trumpets are cleaned. Can't have no dirt in the tubes. And this one has to have a little oil on it every once in a while. Glory! You've been saved by God's grace, purchased by the blood, dug up out of the pit. Well, you got a light, shine it. You got a song, sing it. You got a story, tell it. You got a praise, render it. Let's have God's hand and God's breath and lift up our voice like a trumpet. We're going to close on this point. When I read this in a Jewish encyclopedia, the book went one way, I went another way, and I ran around my bed three or four times. I love it when they called out the front desk, Mr. Arthur, when you checked in, you said there was one occupant. It sounds like there's more than one in your room. I said, it's four of us. I had some visitors during the night. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, can I get an amen? But it said, at the end of the day, the shofar would make a long, straight sound. You know what that meant? The toils and the burdens and the struggles of today are over. Then when that sun is kissing the Judean hills, the shofar would make another long blast. And it's saying, we got a new day. We got a new day. You realize we're on the threshold of the trumpet being sounded that this old world of sin and trouble and heartache is gone forever and the trumpet will remind us we got a new song, we got a new heaven, we got a new body, we got a new worship. Thank God we got a brand new day. Just keep listening. The trumpet is about to blow. Sing with me. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder, 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 Beth, if y'all just play that. Then people that you work with. Greetings, everyone. This is Pastor Joe Arthur from right here at the Harvest Baptist Tabernacle in Jonesburg, Georgia. And I want to personally thank you for joining us today for our online service. I trust the singing, the preaching, the service was a blessing to your life. I trust that it birthed faith and hope and victory in your heart. And if you've tuned in today and you have any questions about your relationship with Jesus Christ, feel free to get in touch with us. We would love to help you come to know Christ and grow in the grace of God. If you're ever in the Atlanta area, I want to extend a personal invitation for you to come and join us. We're right off of Interstate 75 south of the city of Atlanta and the beautiful Lake Spivey community. And we would love to have you come and be with us on Sunday 
and enjoy the service. I would love an opportunity to meet you and your family. I trust you will pray for us here at Harvest. We have a very large mission program. We're involved in a lot of different mission projects. The Lord has been so gracious in opening so many doors, and we need your prayers for wisdom that God will help us follow the path that He has laid before us. If I'm ever preaching in your area, I'd love to, for you to come, and I'd love to greet you and let us know that you're watching our program. Again, thanks for coming by and join us again for our next scheduled program, and we'll see what God will do in our lives.